I want to welcome and thank you all for joining us today for today's healthy living lecture event on heart and valve disease um, hosted by Henry Ford's senior healthy living program. My name is Dr. Josh Greenberg. I'll be your moderator for today's lecture. Uh, I'm a cardiologist and heart rhythm specialist here at Henry Ford Health. Uh, I'm so glad you all are able to join us for this very important topic. Um, this afternoon, you will hear from Dr. Tiberio Frizzoli, a interventional cardiologist and a structural heart specialist at Henry Ford Health. Um, during today's lecture, you will hear about heart valve disease. Um, Dr. Frizzoli will discuss heart valves, the symptoms of heart valve disease, and how this can be treated. So, if you have any questions during or after our presentation, please type your questions into the chat box. Uh, we do ask that you avoid sharing any personal medical information. Um, if you're joining us by telephone today, I'm sorry to tell you that we will not be able to respond to your questions via telephone. But if you do have access to email, you may email your questions during or after our presentation to healthyliving at hfhs.org. Again, that's healthyliving at hfhs.org. Um, we'll try to respond to as many of your questions as possible. Um, also, to ensure a smoother experience for everybody, please turn off your cameras uh, and please note that your microphones have all been muted. Uh, this lecture is being recorded and will be available to watch again at your convenience on the Healthy Living Lecture Series webpage. That can be reached at www.henryford.com forward slash healthy living lectures. Now, I'm pleased to introduce a great friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Tiberio Frizzoli. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenberg. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak to all of you patients or future patients about a topic that I'm particularly passionate about, which is heart valve disease. I, I believe that an informed patient makes the best type of patient. It's so important that patients understand their disease process, understand their treatment options, um, in as much detail as possible so that they can make informed decisions about what they do and what they don't want. Everybody's different. And the field of valvular heart disease is evolving, is innovating. We at Henry Ford are fortunate to be uh, at the front lines of this evolution and this innovation to be able to offer uh, you, the patients of Southeast Michigan, uh, some of the newest, uh, safest, and best treatments for valvular heart disease. And I hope to share some of my knowledge um, and some of the state of the art medicine for valvular heart disease with you today. So I have a, a slide set, and here we go. This is my contact information. The objectives for today are to talk about the anatomy of the four heart valves, the types of valve problems that patients can face, the symptoms of heart valve disease, how we diagnose heart valve disease, how we treat heart valve disease. And I'd like you to think about the treatments in terms of surgical versus transcatheter or minimally invasive, and also in terms of repairing a valve versus replacing a valve. And then we'll talk a little bit about patient selection. How do we tr choose one therapy versus another for any given patient? Not always so straightforward. Let's start with the anatomy of the four heart valves. So there are four heart valves the tricuspid, the pulmonary, the mitral, and the aortic. This is a diagram of the heart. What you'll see is that blood enters the heart through veins, veins that drain the brain, the head, the neck, enter the heart from above, and veins that drain the lower two-thirds of our body enter the heart from below, and veins carry deoxygenated blood to the heart. There are four major chambers of the heart, atria on top, ventricles on the bottom. Atria receive blood, ventricles are the brawn, the muscle of the heart. They pump blood to the lungs and to the rest of the body. There are valves in between all of the chambers. So between the atria and the ventricles, and then between the ventricles and the arteries that the ventricles pump blood into. So in this diagram, you'll see the right atrium here, and through the right atrium, the oxygenated blood goes through the tricuspid valve. It has three leaflets. 
the right ventricle receives the blood and pumps it through the pulmonary valve to the lungs. Okay, pulmonary from Latin for lungs. That blood becomes oxygenated in the lungs where it returns to the left side of the heart, the left atrium. It goes through another valve called the mitral valve, the only valve of the four that has two leaflets, not three. And the mitral valve empties into the left ventricle, which pumps blood to the rest of the body, the brain, the liver, the kidneys, the muscles, through the aortic valve. So in order, tricuspid, pulmonary, lungs, mitral, aortic, rest of the body. You can think of it as a circuit. All blood goes through all of the valves. And that's a concept that's important for you to understand because a problem in one valve can lead to upstream or downstream problems with other valves because all these valves are part of a circuit. Another thing that you have to understand is that valves sit inside the heart, surrounded by heart tissue. So you can have a problem that starts with the valve itself, a flimsy valve, a torn valve, or you can have a problem that starts not with the valve, but with the heart tissue around the valve. And because that heart tissue weakens, dilates, it stretches a valve in an abnormal way that doesn't allow the leaflets of the valve to close the way they're supposed to. This is a diagram of the same thing I just described, but showing it in a little bit more complexity. Tricuspid valve, pulmonary valve, lungs, mitral valve, aortic valve, body. You see that the ventricles have these muscles called papillary muscles, and these cords that insert from the papillary muscles into the valves. These cords keep the leaflet closed because the ventricles can generate an enormous amount of pressure, 140 millimeters of mercury. And those leaflets alone would not be able to withstand the pressure and remain closed if not for the strength of the cords and the pap papillary muscles that keep those leaflets in the position they're meant to be in. This is a diagram that puts everything together, what I just showed. Blue blood enters the right atrium, enters the tricuspid valve. These cords keep the valve closed when the ventricle pumps. And then the valve opens when it's supposed to let blood in. So blue blood enters the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve, goes out the pulmonary valve, and then red oxygenated blood enters the mitral valve into the left ventricle and out through the aortic valve. And you'll notice that the mitral and tricuspid valves close when the aortic and pulmonic valves open. And the aortic and pulmonic valves open when the mitral and tricuspid valves close. It's really a an elegant, sophisticated organ with all these different chambers and valves and arteries that are working together. And again, because it's a circuit, problems in one part of the heart can lead to problems in other parts of the heart. Let's move on, now that we've talked about the anatomy of the heart valves, to types of valve disease. So what can actually happen to valves? They can get stuck, that's called stenosis. They can get leaky, that's called regurgitation. Or they can be both stenotic and regurgitation. So if you have stuckness of the aortic valve, that's called aortic stenosis. If you have leakiness of, say, the mitral valve, that's called mitral regurgitation. So now you can talk like a doctor. So here's the heart, here's a normal aortic valve with three leaflets, and here is a real-life explanted stenotic aortic valve. This heart had aortic stenosis. So you can see why this valve leaflet, which is meant to be nice and thin, might not open so well and be stuck.
All these white specks or nodules on the valve, that's calcium. Over years and years and years of blood going through that heart valve, 60, 70, 80 times a minute, 24 hours a day for 60, 70 years, those leaflets get bombarded with pressure of blood flow, which leads to inflammation and calcification and ultimately stiffness of the aortic valve. Now, what are the effects of aortic stenosis? Well, the heart, the ventricle that you remember pumps blood through the aortic valve, now has to generate a higher pressure to overcome rigid leaflets. That leads to thickening of the heart muscle, which leads to changes in heart function. A patient with aortic stenosis might have so much pressure in the left ventricle that that gets transmitted backwards into the left atrium. And as the left atrium enlarges, that might lead to mitral regurgitation, for example. So a problem that started with one heart valve leads to thickening of the heart muscle, enlargement of the heart muscle, and leaking of a second heart valve, which can then lead to something like atrial fibrillation that Dr. Greenberg is an expert at treating. So all these things are interrelated, and sometimes knowing what was the chicken and what was the egg is part of the challenge. What came first? What do we treat first? These are examples of stenotic valves. So top left is aortic stenosis. Bottom left is aortic stenosis, but in somebody who was born with congenital bicuspid valve, one of the most common congenital or born with heart problems. So because you're born with two leaflets instead of three, the valve can degenerate earlier in life with either regurgitation or stenosis. Most people with trileaflet aortic stenosis don't develop it until their 60s, more commonly 70s, 80s, and 90s. But patients with bicuspid aortic valves can develop aortic stenosis and or aortic regurgitation early in life in their 30s, 40s, 50s. On the right side is the mitral valve, two leaflet valve. And this is an example of rheumatic mitral stenosis. Maybe some of you have heard of rheumatic heart disease. Early in life, you have a throat infection. It leads to a inflammatory response that leads to inflammation of the valve and stuckness of the valve. And this here is mitral annular calcification or calcium buildup on the valve that leads to it being stuck. The point I'm making is that there are a lot of different types of valve problems for each valve. And the mechanism of the valve problem is important to diagnose because the treatment may differ for one type of valve problem than another. So that was stenosis. This is regurgitation or a leaky valve. And I'll focus just for an example on the mitral valve. So on the left side, you're seeing what we call primary mitral regurgitation. There's a problem with the leaflet itself. Maybe some of you have heard of, have heard of mitral valve prolapse. That's when one or more of the scallops of the mitral valve leaflets are flimsy. They're redundant. The medical term we use is myxomatous. And over time, what could happen is that that leaflet actually goes backwards. You remember the cords and the papillary muscles we talked about earlier? Well, over time, there may be an inability of those cords and leaflets to stay shut. The heart pumps, the leaflet goes backwards, and you get a big leak of blood going backwards towards the left atrium and the lungs, which can cause shortness of breath. If you have that problem, you need to fix the valve. But on the right side is something called secondary mitral regurgitation. These leaflets are normal, but the heart muscle around the valve has gotten weakened and dilated. It stretches the valve, and now the valve leaks. So the valve's not the problem. The heart muscle around it is. And there are medications. Um, there are stents. There are types of biventricular pacemakers that Dr. Greenberg, for example, is an expert at placing that may shrink the heart muscle, restoring its function, shrinking the mitral valve, and restoring its function to normal. So on the type of leak on the left, you have to treat the valve. But with the type of leak on the right, 
you have to treat the heart muscle first. And if you can't get the leak to go away with that, then you treat the valve. These are aortic valve regurgitation me mechanisms, stretching of the valve, a tear in the valve leaflet from an infection, for example, a prolapse or flail, okay, or calcium. And this is the tricuspid valve on the bottom that can become leaky because the heart stretches, or sometimes if you have a pacemaker or a defibrillator lead that runs through the valve over years that can, in some unfortunate few, lead to tricuspid regurgitation. So we've talked about the anatomy of the valves, and we've talked about the types of valve problems that can happen. So what symptoms might you experience if you have a heart valve problem? Well, they are symptoms that are very common with heart disease. Shortness of breath, chest tightness, fatigue, swelling, an inability to lie down where you just don't feel comfortable. Maybe you cough when you lie down and when you sit back upright, your cough goes away or your sensation of shortness of breath goes away. These are important symptoms for you to mention to your doctor and to keep in mind. These are not, however, symptoms that are specific to heart valve disease. Lung disease can cause some of these problems, endocrine, liver, kidney. But if you do have these symptoms and you do have and you do mention them to your doctor, there are some great tests that allow us to tell you whether or not your symptoms are from heart valve disease. So how do we diagnose heart valve problems? Well, sometimes a physical exam, which is not helpful for our, some medical conditions, can be really helpful for heart valve disease. If somebody is experienced in listening to murmurs with a stethoscope, they can put their stethoscope in various positions on the chest and they can listen for the character, the quality, the pitch, and the timing of the murmur. At what phase in the cardiac cycle does the murmur happen? And somebody skilled in listening to murmurs may already be able to predict, aha, that's a murmur of aortic stenosis. That's a murmur of mitral valve regurgitation. But the real most valuable test is an ultrasound of the heart called an echocardiogram. On the left, I show you a transthoracic echocardiogram, meaning through the thorax. And on the right, I show you a transesophageal echocardiogram, meaning the ultrasound probe is not on the chest wall. It's in the esophagus, the tube between the mouth and the stomach. A transthoracic echo is more comfortable for the patient. It's very quick and easy to do, 30 minutes and you're done. It doesn't require usually any anesthesia. And it gives you a wealth of information. However, because the ultrasound probe is forced to emit sound waves that have to go through bone and muscle and cartilage and lungs, you don't always see the heart valves really, really, really well. Whereas when you do a transesophageal echocardiogram, you're right up behind the heart and there's nothing in between. There's no lungs or muscle or bone really. And many of the heart valves that we look at, they actually are in the posterior half of the heart. So they're very close to the esophagus. So you get these beautiful images. So it would be very common if one were diagnosed with a heart valve problem by transthoracic echocardiogram and physical exam for a doctor to ask for a transesophageal echocardiogram. And for that, we give you a little bit of sedation, make you comfortable, and then have you Swallow a probe with a cardiac anesthesiologist monitoring your oxygen levels, your blood pressure, your heart rate. 
so it can be done safely. And it gives us a wealth of information to plan the next steps in your treatment. This is an example of an image that you might get from a transesophageal echocardiogram. This is the aortic valve that's opening and closing normally. And this is the mitral valve right next to it that's opening fine, but when it closes, one of the leaflets is prolapsing backwards. That's the primary mitral regurgitation I was talking about before. You would not be able to get this quality of image from a transthoracic echo usually. And from this image, a surgeon and an interventional cardiologist like myself may be able to talk to you in a great deal of detail about what your treatment options are. So we've talked about anatomy and physiology. We've talked about the types of valve disease, stenosis and regurgitation or both. We've talked about the diagnosis of valve problems stethoscope physical exam, transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiogram. I didn't get into CT scans and MRIs. Sometimes they're very valuable as well. But now let's talk about interventions or treatments for valve disease. Well, the first treatment for valve disease may often be medications. Um, if your blood pressure is very high, we'll treat your blood pressure. If you've accumulated a lot of fluid, in your system, in your lungs, in your legs. We may start a water pill like Lasix or Torsamide or Bumex. I mentioned earlier, if you have secondary mitral regurgitation, we'll start you on pills to strengthen your heart valve. But treatments specific to the valve itself fall into two categories, repairing the valve, replacing the valve. And Repairs and replacements can be done nowadays with open heart surgery or in select patients with transcatheter therapies, minimally invasive therapies. That's what I do, where through a tube inserted usually in the arteries or veins of the legs or arms or neck, you can repair or replace valves. So these are pictures here of open heart surgery. On the left, a surgeon is replacing the aortic valve. That's with a bioprosthetic or tissue valve. If you're particularly young, you may get a mechanical valve because they last a really long time, but they require blood thinners. On the right, you're seeing a repair of the mitral valve. This is a ring that has been sewn around the leaflets of the valve to shrink the valve. And by shrinking the valve with that ring, leaflets that were stretched so they didn't close well are now brought together so that they close really well and don't regurgitate. This is an example of a minimally invasive or transcatheter alternative to open heart surgery, and this is called TAVR. It's somewhat revolutionized the way we treat aortic stenosis, stuckness of the aortic valve. Somebody skilled in this procedure will take a needle, go into usually the artery of the groin, and under x-ray, pass a wire into the heart through that stuck aortic valve, and then over that wire, they'll deliver a valve. And there's various valves on the market. <clears throat> the one I'm showing happens to be a balloon expandable valve called a sapien valve. And under x-ray, that valve is very carefully positioned in just the right place inside of a patient's su sick, stuck aortic valve. So because you're not opening somebody's chest up, you can't go in and cut the old valve in and sew a new one in, but you can place a fresh valve inside of a, a sick valve. And when that valve is expanded, the new leaflets immediately start 
opening and closing normally, appropriately doing the job that those sick stuck valves were no longer doing. And here you're gonna see it right now. We're carefully positioning the valve. You don't wanna to be too high. You don't wanna to be too low. You inflate a balloon. You deflate the balloon and the leaflets immediately start working. Are there complications with this procedure? Sure, like with any procedure, you're in the heart, but the complication rates are relatively low. There's less than one and a half, two percent chance of a major complication such as stroke. And people recover from this procedure very well. They can go home sometimes as early as the next day. I've done this procedure, believe it or not, in 80, 90-year-olds. I even took care of a 103-year-old patient before who, who wanted to go back and, and dance. So that was a treatment for aortic stenosis. Now let me show you a minimally invasive or transcatheter uh, treatment for um, mitral regurgitation. This is called the mitral clip. Similarly, you're not doing open heart surgery in this transcatheter therapy. You're going in through the vein of the groin, needle poke, this time in a vein, not in an artery. And you're sliding a needle, very small needle, to the right atrium, and you're crossing from the right atrium to the left atrium, something that Dr. Greenberg, for example, does all the time for treatments for atrial fibrillation, supraventricular tachycardias, and other things. When we're in the left atrium, we can steer with a series of knobs a clip down and into the valve, and we find the valve where it's leaking the most, and we grab the leaflets so that the leaflets that were not co-apting or coming together well, as you can see in this video, you pin them together in a very specific location so that the valve can still open normally on either side of the clip, but in that one specific area where the leak was the worst, the leaflets are pinned together so that there's no leak there. Because you're not replacing the valve, you usually don't get the leak down to zero, but if you drop somebody's mitral regurgitation from severe to mild, trivial, or even mild to moderate, it's been shown that people breathe better, they stay out of the hospital, and they live longer. So I showed you two examples, a TAVR for aortic stenosis and a mitral clip or tear, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair for mitral regurgitation, but there are others. So how about patient selection? And we'll wrap up at the end of this last section. How do we choose whether to intervene on somebody or not? How do we choose whether somebody is better off only with medications or also with repairing or replacing the valve? And if we're going to repair or replace the valve, how do we choose if it should be surgery or transcatheter? Well, that's a topic for a whole several hours course because it's not straightforward, but I will try to make it as simple as I can for you. Regardless of the valve condition, it's important to make a diagnosis early so that you can treat the disease process before it has the upstream and downstream effects on the heart. For example, the example I gave earlier where the heart muscle can start to thicken or dilate. Many times, the treatment for valve disease may be medications only. <clears throat> for example, if you're in the hospital with congestive heart failure and you have severe mitral regurgitation and we give you Lasix and you lose 5, 10, 20 pounds of water weight, your mitral regurgitation can go from severe to mild. Or if you have a weak heart muscle and we start you on medications that strengthen the heart muscle, same thing, the mitral regurgitation can go away. It's when medications alone don't treat the problem, and some valve conditions can't be treated with medications. Aortic stenosis, for example, will not get better with medications alone.
That's when you repair or replace. And it depends on the type of valve and type of problem that determines whether we repair or replace. Aortic stenosis, we always repair. Aortic regurgitation, we almost always, I'm sorry, aortic stenosis, we always replace. Aortic regurgitation, we almost always replace. Mitral regurgitation, we tend to prefer to repair, but we sometimes replace. So it depends on the problem. Now, what about surgery versus minimally invasive? Well, that comes down to a few things. But one of the things that it comes down to is what is your risk for surgery? And we can use a calculator called the STS risk score calculator. And you plug in somebody's age, height, weight, gender, risk factors like smoking, diabetes, lung disease, how sick their heart muscle is. And we get an estimate of how risky the surgery will be. What is the likelihood of dying or having a prolonged hospitalization after surgery? And that goes into our calculating whether you're better off with surgery or with transcatheter. For some valve conditions like aortic stenosis, we've come a really long way with transcatheter therapies where we're actually treating more patients with aortic stenosis with TAVR than we are with surgery. In some other valve conditions like mitral regurgitation, we treat with surgery unless you're high risk for surgery, in which case we treat transcatheter with, for example, the mitral clip. So for different valves and for different disease processes, stenosis or regurgitation, we may recommend surgery versus transcatheter. And so I conclude with this summary slide. Valve disease is common. If you have some of the symptoms I mentioned earlier, like shortness of breath, inability to lie flat, swelling, see your primary care physician or see your cardiologist. Get a physical exam, and ultimately you may end up with an echocardiogram and even a transesophageal echocardiogram for a diagnosis. Treatments are becoming more and more minimally invasive. For aortic stenosis, we're doing more TAVR than surgery. For aortic regurgitation, we're doing more surgery than TAVR, but there's a new valve for TAVR that's being studied. And we have that valve at Henry Ford Health. For mitral stenosis, it's surgery or a transcatheter mitral balloon valvuloplasty. TMVR stands for transcatheter mitral replacement. We're still studying that and we have done many cases. For mitral regurgitation, it's surgery if you're lower in or immediate risk for surgery. It's mitral clip or something called Pascal, same thing, two devices that do the same thing if you're high risk for surgery. And for tricuspid regurgitation, it's surgery, or we now have, as of February of this year, an FDA-approved valve replacement that can be done transcatheter through the groin. Thank you so very much for joining. I hope you found this helpful. And um, this is my contact information as well as some numbers uh, for our call center. If you're in the Detroit area, it's the 916 number. If you're in the Jackson, Henry Ford Jackson area, it's that number, the 517 number. Uh, for any, any referrals that you'd like to make to the uh, valve team or the Center for Structural Heart Disease. And I'd be very, very happy to take um, any questions from our audience. Thank you. Most of us had an annual wellness visit as recommended by Medicare. Um, should we need also an annual heart evaluation? If so, what needs to be evaluated? Yeah. So not everybody needs an, a cardiologist. Uh, primary care physicians are our front line. They are exceptionally uh, skilled in knowing when to make a referral to a specialist. So um, I would say that um, if you are a patient who regularly sees your primary care physician and your primary care physician doesn't elicit uh, symptoms of heart disease, then you may not need an annual cardiology visit. 
A primary care physician is also in a very good position to handle some of the disease processes that can lead to heart disease, such as high blood pressure or hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia or high bad cholesterol, and other things. They know how to treat those conditions. Uh, but when you are diagnosed with a heart problem, for example, a heart valve problem, yes, it is usually um, wise to see a cardiologist regularly so that a decision can be made as to when to treat you with surgery or a transcatheter therapy, and then after a treatment to follow that valve problem over time because surgeries and transcatheter therapies don't always last you uh, your whole life. You may need repeat interventions, especially if you get them earlier in your life. Thank you, Dr. Fazoli. Um, I have a question for you. Um, so, you know, you, you call these procedures minimally invasive, and I agree they are. Um, do they hurt? And how soon do people start feeling better after them? That's a great question. So they shouldn't hurt. Uh, you may feel the needle poke um, when we numb up the skin with something called lidocaine. Um, you may feel a little bit of pressure, but they shouldn't hurt. We do some of these procedures under general anesthesia. So you'll be asleep and out. You'll have a breathing tube down and a transesophageal echo probe down. But we're moving more and more towards less sedation because there are side effects with general anesthesia. And there will be an anesthesiologist usually at the head of the table, and you will be able to speak to that anesthesiologist and say, hey, I'm a little anxious, I'm a little claustrophobic, I feel a little bit more than I would like. And the anesthesiologist may make you more sleepy. Do some patients occasionally say, you know what, I felt more than I wish I had? Yes. But generally speaking, most of my patients will tell me when the procedure is done, wow, I, I can't believe you just replaced or repaired my heart valve. Uh, I was half awake and I didn't really feel anything. As far as your question about recovery and, and how quickly you may feel better, after a standard TAVR or mitral clip or tricuspid replacement, it would not be um, surprising to go home as early as the next day. And if your valve problem was really severe and really driving your symptoms, you may feel significantly better the very next day, or maybe within the next few weeks when you go home and you start to replicate some of the activities um, that were making you feel unwell. Now, I just want to emphasize one thing. That probably sounds great. And most patients walk into my office or most physician's office saying, I don't want surgery. I want the minimally invasive thing because I can get home the next day. I don't like the idea of my chest being cracked open. And I understand that. I think most people would say that. But there are still some valve problems that are better treated with surgery. They're more durable or they get you a better result. The technology is evolving and more and more valve problems are being treated minimally invasively, but there are still some valve problems that are best suited for surgical treatment. I guess this leads into a great question by Stephanie here. Um, what are the treatment options for a bicuspid aortic valve? And I assume that's bicuspid aortic valve in the setting of both stenosis, meaning a tight valve or regurgitation, a leaky valve. Great question. So if you have bicuspid aortic regurgitation without stenosis, right now, April of 2024, your only treatment option is surgery. There is no transcatheter therapy, FDA approved or investigational, meaning in a research trial, for pure bicuspid aortic regurgitation. That may come. If you have bicuspid aortic stenosis, then you can actually get a TAVR. There's more and more data showing the safety and efficacy of TAVR for bicuspid aortic stenosis. 
it really comes down to how old you are and what a CAT scan shows in terms of your anatomy for TAVR versus surgery. So if you have bicuspid aortic stenosis with really dense, heavy, heavy asymmetric calcium, you're probably better off having that calcium removed, which can only be done with open heart surgery, and a fresh valve sewn in. Or if you have what's called an ascending aortic aneurysm, the artery that comes out of the heart can sometimes be enlarged in patients with bicuspid aortic valve. Well, with surgery, you're taking care of both the bicuspid valve and repairing the aneurysm. But if you don't have an aneurysm and you're not super young, 40, 50, let's say you're in your mid to late 60s or 70s, we have done TAVR in bicuspid aortic stenosis with a great deal of success. So uh, this is a question from Judith uh, in the chat. What causes these calcium deposits on valves? And I, I would like to add, you know, is there something we can do with diet or exercise to stop these things, um, you know, before you need a procedure? Great question. You know, whoever figures out how to stop calcium formation in the body is going to win an, a Nobel Prize. It is, it is um, a humongous problem in the vessels and the heart of the body. Calcium can form in arteries, in heart valves. Uh, it can form in one artery, but not in another. I've seen patients that had calcium up and down their aorta and not a speck of calcium in their coronary arteries or their valves. I've seen patients that had dense, dense calcium on a valve and not a speck of calcium anywhere else in their body. The short answer is we don't know. We don't know. And one thing you can do to prevent calcium formation, especially in the arteries of the body, the arteries of the legs, for example, is to not smoke cigarettes. Smoking leads to a incredible uh, inflammatory process that is probably the strongest risk factor for what's called peripheral artery disease and calcium formation in the arteries of the body. So in general, not smoking, living an active life, eating a heart healthy diet are all things that will help prevent heart disease and help you survive heart disease were you to develop it but we still don't have treatments for removing calcium or preventing the formation of calcium. We have ways to break down calcium with balloons and other things, but we don't really have great ways to prevent the formation of calcium. Uh, here's another question from the chat. Um, can taking calcium supplements then be harmful? And it should we measure calcium levels in the blood to determine your risk of having these issues with your valves? Calcium supplements will not lead to uh, aortic stenosis or mitral stenosis or calcium formation in the coronary arteries. There's no evidence that calcium supplements are um, harmful in that way, nor has there been any evidence that measuring your calcium level in your bloodstream will predict development of valve stenosis, coronary artery disease, uh, nor will measuring your calcium level in your bloodstream allow a physician to start you on a medication that can halt that process. Uh, the best thing you can do, um, in addition to being physically active, eating a heart healthy diet, not smoking, is reporting symptoms to your doctor. And the more active you are, the more you'll notice symptoms early. If you're very inactive, overweight, you may not notice symptoms of heart valve disease or heart disease in general until that problem is pretty advanced. And the more advanced it is, the harder it may be to treat. So. Being physically active is not only good for your health, 
it will allow for earlier detection of heart valve disease. All right, I, I have a question for myself. You said these these valves last. How long can we expect something like a TAVR valve to last on average? Yes, so surgery allows you to get a mechanical valve or a tissue valve. TAVR only allows you to get a tissue valve. If you go to surgery and you get a mechanical valve, you can expect that valve to last you decades, 20, 30, 40 plus years. As long as you take a blood thinner, usually Coumadin, the leaflets will stay healthy. They'll continue to open and close. Sometimes the stitching, the sewing around the valve can become a problem, but the valve itself will most likely not fail in your lifetime. However, it comes with the requirement for a blood thinner. If you get a tissue valve, and again, that can be a tissue valve implanted surgically, or that can be a tissue valve implanted through TAVR. We believe, based on some trials just done in the last few years, that the durability of TAVR valves is similar to the durability of surgical valves. What number is that, though? It's different for everybody. Risk factors for earlier degeneration of a surgical valve, or a, a, I should say a tissue valve, are younger age and smaller valve. So if you're 55 and you get a 23 millimeter valve or a 20 millimeter valve, that may last you less than if you're 75 and you get a 26 millimeter valve. With all of that said, what I usually tell my patients is that they can expect their TAVR valve to last them somewhere on the order of 7 to 12 years. I've seen TAVR valves and surgical valves fail, unfortunately, in the unlucky few in as little as 3 or 4 years, and I've seen tissue valves last 15 plus years. So I usually say on average somewhere in the order of 7, 8, 9, 10 years. So uh, another question in the chat, um, it's in people that are not active and not noticing problems, um, do they need a stress test uh, to kind of screen for these issues? Uh, this says in their 40s, but, you know, what at what time do we consider that? Controversial, but if you go according to the guidelines, the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, the European Society of Cardiology, has guidelines. Now, guidelines are guidelines, meaning they're recommendations. <clears throat> Physician doesn't have to follow them, but they're rooted in data. They're rooted in well-done, usually large, prospective randomized trials. The guidelines will tell you that the strongest indication for a stress test is in somebody with symptoms. Somebody that a year ago was able to climb stairs and walk distances and now is maybe having some vague shortness of breath or chest discomfort with activity. Are there other scenarios where why we, whereby we get stress tests? Yes. Yes, there are. For example, if you're found to have a lot of calcium in your coronary arteries on a screening CAT scan done for some other reason, uh, but usually we get stress tests in patients that are symptomatic, that have symptoms that make us suspect blockages. Now, this talk today was about valvular heart disease. Stress tests are usually done to look for blockages in the heart arteries. That's something else. That's called coronary artery disease. But actually, Stress tests can also be helpful in valvular heart disease. We sometimes put patients on a treadmill and have them walk to see what happens to that valvular heart disease. Does the mitral regurgitation get worse with activity? Is the aortic stenosis actually causing you symptoms that you didn't realize you had because you weren't actually walking all that much? But 
usually when we talk about stress tests, we talk about looking at blockages in the heart arteries, not in the valves. And usually we get stress tests for patients with symptoms, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I would ask you to talk to your cardiologist about that. But I will say that just getting regular stress tests, for example, every year in somebody that doesn't really have any symptoms that make you suspect coronary artery disease is probably not in your best interest. There are potential, rare, but potential side effects of stress tests. And there are what are called false positives and false negatives. But a false positive is when a stress test comes back as abnormal, but in reality it wasn't. And that can lead to potentially unnecessary downstream testing like heart casts and other things. So it's a great question that doesn't have a simple answer, but I hope I answered it a little bit for you. I think we have time. Um, sorry, my video keeps coming in and out. Um, ask which um, Henry Ford Medical Centers have cardiology units. I think in particular, um, you know, pretty much all the Henry Ford Medical Centers have cardiology available, but um, which of our cardiology centers have the ability to perform these transcatheter procedures? Wonderful question. So, uh, all of the transcatheter therapies that I mentioned today, uh, Tavifer aortic stenosis, uh, mitral clip, Pascal, <clears throat> tricuspid replacement, and even the research ones, the investigational therapies, those are at Henry Ford in Detroit, meaning Henry Ford in Detroit is the only center in the Henry Ford Health System that has all of them. However, Henry Ford Macomb and Henry Ford Jackson have TAVR. They also have some other minimally invasive procedures, um, like stenting procedures, like watchman procedures, like closures of PFOs. They don't have mitral valve, tricuspid valve, and pulmonary valve transcatheter therapies right now. In the future, they, they very well may. Henry Ford uh, Wyandotte, Henry Ford West Bloomfield, the others, they do not have um, transcatheter valve interventions uh, right now. All right, perfect. Well, uh, this brings us to uh, kind of the end of our event here. Um, again, as a reminder, this lecture has been recorded and will be available to watch again and share with friends and family members. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, you can visit henryford.com forward slash healthy living lectures to view Dr. Frizzoli's presentation. Um, if you'd like to schedule an appointment at any time with the cardiology department at Henry Ford, you can reach us at 844-725-6424. Again, the number to schedule an appointment is 844-725-6424, or you can visit us at our website, henryford.com forward slash cardiology. Um, again, the website is henryford.com forward slash cardiology. Um, this, this information will also be in the chat box. Um, if you're not a member of Henry Ford's Senior Living Program, you can sign up for this free program, which is open to anyone age 55 and older. Uh, to enroll in the program, you can go to henryford.com forward slash healthy living or call 313-874-5455. Um, the website and telephone number will also be posted in the chat box. Um, as a member of the Healthy Living Program, you'll receive the annual, the Healthy Living Newsletter, which is published three times per year. The Healthy uh, the annual health and wellness calendar and invitations to all healthy living lecture series and other ben benefits. Um, before we conclude for this afternoon, I'd like to announce that the next healthy living lecture event will feature a discussion on stroke awareness and prevention and will take place on Tuesday, May 14th from 12 to 1 p.m. Again, that's Tuesday, May 14th to 12 from 12 to 1 p.m. Again, we hope you can all join us again. Um, watch your email for an invitation to the May 14th lecture event and also visit henryford.com forward slash Henry Healthy Living Lectures. Again, that's henryford.com 
forward slash healthy living lectures anytime for some more information and to register. Uh, on behalf of myself and Dr. Frizzoli and the Healthy Living Program, thank you for joining us today. Uh, have a wonderful weekend.